I'm not gonna lie. Today's message and the scripture passage that goes along with it is one of the toughest things that Jesus ever said. I mean, in the passage, he says to one of, one of his followers, get behind me, Satan. And then he follows it up by saying to a bunch of people, if you wanna follow me, you have to take up your cross and deny yourself daily. Now, if you're a Christian, you've probably heard that before. And if you're a member of Hyde Park, you've probably heard us talk about our seven spiritual practices and help us grow deeper in our relationship with God and with others. And in today's message, our senior pastor, McGray DeVega, is gonna remind us about those seven spiritual practices and how we can be engaged in each of them. But if you're not a member of Hyde Park, maybe you've just been attending a little while, or you're not even a Christian, this might be a really weird message to hear. So I wanna give you a little bit of a heads up as we go into it. If you're not a Christian, these seven spiritual practices are ways to be deeper in your relationship with Jesus once you have a relationship with Jesus. But they're not prerequisites. They're not things that you have to do to have a relationship with Jesus. In fact, if you're feeling like uh, you wanna make the world a more whole place, a more safe place, a more loving place, you're already on the right path to beginning to discover more about who Jesus is because Jesus is the kind of person that wants the world to be put back together, to be put to right. And if you've only been attending Hyde Park for a little bit, don't worry, there's no expectation that you figure out all seven of these things at once. In fact, think about the first three of worship, small groups, and serving as a great starting point. McGray is gonna mention it in the message, but if you go to hydeparkumc.org slash discipleship dash pathway, you can read for yourself a little bit about these seven spiritual practices. So check out this message, and I'll be back at the end to tell you some next steps you can take. Let's pray together. Oh God, open our eyes to empathy, curiosity, and humility, that we might be generous and compassionate toward others and ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus and Peter must have had a really complicated relationship. There was so much that Jesus appreciated about Peter, but there were many times when he just had to shake his head. One moment, Peter is walking on water. And the next moment, he is sinking for lack of faith. One moment, Peter is in the upper room, pledging his loyalty to Jesus. And a few hours later, he hears the crow of a rooster. The life of Peter reminds us, time and again, of the fine line between commitment and non-commitment to Jesus. Between offering Jesus your full self and putting yourself ahead of Jesus. And no other passage in the gospel portrays the speed of that pendulum swing quite like this one. At first, Peter gets it right. Jesus asked the disciples a question that is nothing short of the most important question in human history. Who do people say that I am? And the disciples' answers were quite reasonable albeit not entirely accurate. Some said he was John the Baptist. That makes sense. A new emerging voice calling people to repentance. Some said he was Elijah. Well, that makes sense too. A voice of justice who cared for the poor and the vulnerable. Some said he was one of the prophets. You bet. A voice that challenged the earthly and religious powers of the world. But Jesus was more than that. And so that's when he turned to Peter, his prized pupil, our spiritual ancestor, by the way, upon whom the church and all of us would be built. Peter, who do you say that I am? And when Peter said, you are the Messiah, we would have thought he got the right answer. And it was, in a way, Jesus came to be the Messiah, the the anointed one, the long-awaited deliverer sent from God to set the people free. Peter's words were right. There was no other correct answer. Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Except, except Jesus knew something about Peter in that moment. He, He knew there was a fine line between commitment and non-commitment. And deep within Peter's heart, he had crossed it. And you know what? It's the very same fine line that you and I need to wrestle with, not just during Lent, but every single day. 
in order to maintain our full commitment to Jesus. You see, Peter had gotten the words right, but he had the meaning of those words completely wrong. When he said, you are the Messiah, Peter believed, Peter believed that it meant that his life was going to get easier, that the oppressive forces in the world would be toppled, that his side would win, and that he could then begin to live a life of prestige and comfort and ease, the kind of life he'd always wanted. Little did he know that by calling Jesus the Messiah, more would be required of him, not less. He needed to learn that following Jesus is not about what benefits it brings us. It's about what it demands of us. Last year, researchers Jim Davis and Michael Graham published a book that has been gathering a lot of attention in church leadership circles. It's titled, The Great Dechurching. Who's leaving, why they're going, and what will it take to bring them back? It's an intriguing title with an even more surprising premise because they say that the primary reason many people have stopped going to church and left organized religion is not because of scandal or hypocrisy or polarization or secular humanism, although many of those things are at play. The key reason for many people it has just become a lot easier to drift away from church participation in order to seek social connection in other places to address their sense of isolation. I mean, these people who leave might still consider themselves doctrinally connected. Yeah, I believe Jesus is the Messiah. But they let go of what that ought to mean in shaping their spiritual practices. It's become too comfortable and convenient to look for connection outside the church. In a review of that book in The Atlantic Magazine, the author diagnoses this issue pretty bluntly. Here's a quote. Contemporary America simply isn't set up to promote mutuality or care or common life. Rather, it's designed to maximize individual accomplishment as divined by professional and financial success. And such a system leaves precious little time or energy for forms of community that don't contribute to one's professional life or as one ages, the professional prospects of one's children. Workism reigns in America, the article says. And because of it, community in America religious community included, is a math problem that doesn't add up. And the author of that article invites us into this pretty compelling thought experiment to imagine some examples of these people. Here's the first one. A 30-something woman who grew up in a suburban megachurch was heavily invested in a campus ministry while in college and then after graduating, moved into a full-time job and began attending a young adults group in a local church. In her 20s, she meets a guy who is less religiously engaged. They get married, and at some point early in their marriage, after their first or second child is born, they stop going to church. Maybe the baby isn't sleeping well, and when Sunday morning comes around, it is simply easier to stay home and catch whatever sleep is available as the baby finally falls asleep. Here's another example. A person is entering mid-career, working a high-stress job requiring a 60 or 70 hour work week. Add to that 15 hours of commute time and suddenly something like two-thirds of their waking hours in the week are already accounted for. And so, when a friend invites them to a Sunday morning brunch, I mean, they, they probably want to go to church, but they also want to see that friend because they haven't been able to see them for months. And the friend wins out. Hmm. In each of these two examples, and in so many other examples like them, 
These are people who, when asked by Jesus, who do you say that I am? They would probably answer correctly. Yeah, you're the Messiah, just like Peter did. But there's the fine line again. Confronting us just as it did Peter. Believing Jesus is the Messiah is not about what ease and comfort life would bring to you. It is more about what it would demand of you. This idea was so troubling to Peter that he immediately pushed back on Jesus. No, Jesus, you don't, you don't have to suffer. You don't have to die. You're the Messiah. You can have it all. You can live a life of prestige and comfort and ease. And, and, and that's, that's when the Bible says that Jesus rebuked Peter in the strongest possible terms. He said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For anyone struggling to navigate that fine line between commitment and non-commitment, Jesus offers those exact same four words. Take up your cross. In that same article from The Atlantic, the authors actually suggest, they actually suggest that for the church to be the catalyst for social connection and societal transformation, in order for the church to live into its potential as a change agent for good, then it needs to remember that God demands more of those who follow Jesus, not less, to take up a cross. The article says, quote, a vibrant, life-giving church requires more, not less, time and energy from its members. It asks people to prioritize one another over our career, to prioritize prayer and time reading scripture over accomplishment. This may seem like a tough sell in an era of de-churching, the article says, but here is what is at stake. It asks the question, what is more needed in our time than a community marked by sincere love? sharing what they have from each according to their ability and to each according to their need, eating together regularly, generously serving neighbors, and living lives of quiet virtue and prayer. It says a healthy church can be a safety net in the harsh American economy by offering its members material assistance in times of need, meals after a baby is born, money for rent after a layoff. Perhaps more importantly, it reminds people that their identity is not in their job or how much they make. They are children of God, loved and protected and infinitely valuable." Unquote. You know, obviously, it would have been a whole lot easier if Peter were right about the life of faith to begin with, being more about the benefits it brings us. And we would have loved it if Jesus had not said what he said about demanding more of us in our faith, not less. Because this sermon, for one, would have been a whole lot easier to hear. But if you claim Jesus to be the Messiah, you cannot follow the path of greater convenience. You follow his example down the path of greater diligence. You take up the cross every single day. And if you ask me what it means to take up a cross in the context of Hyde Park United Methodist Church, my answer would be to follow the spiritual practices outlined in our discipleship pathway. That's the term we use to talk about the seven spiritual practices we say constitute the faithful Christian life. And to take up a cross means to take the next step in growing in each of these seven practices one day at a time. There are three corporate practices that we do together, worship, small groups, service. It means being present in worship either in person or online every week. 
being involved in a small group experience to help you grow in the faith with others, and being actively involved in service in and through this church. And then there are the four private practices that we remember through the acronym GRIP, giving generously of our finances, reading scripture regularly without fear or frustration, inviting others to faith in Christ, and praying regularly. If you'd like to learn more about our discipleship pathway, you can read about it on our website, hydeparkumc.org forward slash discipleship hyphen pathway, or just go to our next steps page. And there you'll find resources and tools to take the next step in deepening your faith. There is a part of us that wishes the Christian life weren't so demanding. We would much prefer a faith that offers us nothing but benefits <laughs> rather than demands. But that's not what it means to call Jesus Messiah. How will you take up your cross and follow him? What's the next step you need to take in growing stronger in the seven practices of the discipleship pathway? What will be your part in offering the world a church at its healthiest and best, in which followers of Jesus each do their part to embody love and offer good news and be a community of love and support for others. There is a fine line between commitment and non-commitment. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Let's pray together. God, in Jesus, you gave us the greatest gift we would ever receive and the one that we needed the most. There is nothing we could do to deserve the salvation you've given us. Now help us to give ourselves to you in response. In those moments when we would drift away toward an easier life of convenience, let us hear those words again, as starkly and strongly as the disciples first heard them. Take up your cross. Give us strength and faithfulness to do just that, one day at a time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us for this message. You might have connected with what McGray was saying about the great de-churching, or maybe even about the, the two profiles he gave of people who've been um, you know, too busy, basically, for church, right? I've got three young kids at home. Uh, I go to church because I work at a church. If I didn't work at a church, I'd probably be like many people who find Sundays as the time to get caught up on their housework or get caught up on a TV show or just hang out with their kids, right? So I can relate to that. Here's what I want you to hear though. This isn't a guilt trip. These seven spiritual practices aren't something that if you don't do them, you're a bad person. They're sort of a rubric, a marker to kind of strive towards. Again, if you're not a Christian and this is all new to you, don't even worry about that right now. Just continue listening to our messages, engaging with our community because I know that we have something to offer you this related to our justice work, this related to our mission of making God's love real, this resonating with your heart and with your soul in some way that maybe you don't understand quite yet and maybe we don't understand quite yet. And if you've just been attending a little while, continue attending, continue checking us out, continue exploring the spiritual practices, again, those big three of worship, small group, and serving. And hopefully uh, you'll find a deeper relationship with Jesus through those three things. Down in the notes below are some next steps you can take, some reflection questions you can use to go deeper with this message. I'm Matt Hotho. I'm so glad you joined us. We'll see you next time.